Hello, everybody. I'm Ivan Novik. From, I work at Pivotal, working on the Green Plum database. And tonight, we're going to be, we have a meetup tonight. It's the Green Plum database meetup every month here in San Francisco at Pivotal's office. And tonight, the topic is geospatial analytics. And geospatial analytics, in particular, running with the Green Plum database at massive scale. So thanks, everybody, for joining. We're going to get going. So first of all, the geospatial analytics, when used in Greenplum database, leverage the PostGIS project. So PostGIS is a spatial database extender. It leverages the extensibility of the Postgres platform. And it's been around since 2001. Uh, we, we see Paul Ramsey is a, is a very active community member who's one of the co-founders. And it was created by Refractions Research back in 2001. Um, and what it does is it enables geospatial data types, geospatial functions, and indexes on geospatial data to run in the Postgres database. Um, there are other databases that have similar modules. So if you look, for example, at Oracle database, they have geospatial adapters to convert their database into geospatial as well. And really, it's just because Postgres is so extensible, it was quite easy to, to add this capability into, into Postgres-based systems. Now, this is, this is the website, postgis.net. And, and that's where you can see all the collateral from the project. Now, how does this tie in to Greenplum? Greenplum is a massively parallel database based on Postgres. So if you see here in this architecture that there are multiple Postgres database instances that make up a Greenplum cluster. Here we see multiple segment hosts, and we can be running multiple Postgreses on each host. So for example, you could be having 20 hosts, 50 hosts, 100 hosts, 200 hosts, 300 hosts, and on each host have two, four, or eight, or 12 different Postgreses reaching up 1,000, 2,000 different Postgreses in one cohesive cluster. And what this allows for is it allows us to scale Postgres to bigger data sets to do cohesive analytics and querying on large data sets using the Postgres-based technology. Now, I did mention, quote, quote, Postgres instances because they're not pure Postgres instances. They're modified for Greenplum in order to support this MPP and big data, data warehousing use case. And so you'll see that there's a custom interconnect. So within a query plan, we've got custom interconnect nodes that can ship data to the other nodes. We've got an optimizer, which is MPP aware and can create a query plan that minimizes the cost, including data mo movement across the cluster. We've got a dispatcher that can dispatch queries out to all the nodes, and, and a transaction manager, a global transaction manager, to, to keep consistency across the entire cluster with any given transaction that somebody runs, begin, SQL, commit, et cetera. So by taking this big data green plum architecture, and applying PostGIS on top of it, we can now open up the ability to use the, the same valuable functions created for Postgres, but at scale. Now, what does a reference architecture look like? So in an environment where you're processing and dealing with a lot of geospatial data, there are different use cases. And, and this is a reference architecture for, for one of the users that I'm familiar with who's heavily leveraging Greenplum for geospatial data. So what they have in, in this architecture is both. They have Greenplum for the geospatial data warehouse, and then they have native Postgres for their geospatial database. Now, the native Postgres is what's useful for quick lookups. So you want to have an interactive application where you're doing rapid, let's say, displaying of points up on a map in a screen in front of a user. And you want to just get the data out quick and display it based on, on directed queries. And so that's where the Postgres comes in. 
And then the green plum comes in when you want to store bigger sets of data and, and do multi-row processing and analytics on that data. What you can then do if you want to have an open source architecture is you can leverage GeoServer. So GeoServer is part of the open source, open source geospatial foundation and it's a middle tier. So these are the database tier, right? We're creating geospatial databases by extending the data types and the functions in the database. But GeoServer is a middle, is a middle um, tier component, which is a web server based component to allow for um, talking to the database, organizing the data from the database, displaying it back to UIs and browsers in order for an end user to manipulate the data. So you've got your, your user, your analyst there, they're talking to GeoServer, and GeoServer is redirecting the queries both to Postgres and to Greenplum, depending on what is the nature of the query and the routing they've set up in the GeoServer. So what are some example data sets and use cases where you've got large amounts of geospatial data and it's not sufficient just to have one host to store this data where you want to do storing lots of information and be able to process and analyze it. So I wanted to open up your mind to the art of the possible of geospatial and how it's impactful to the world and how it, it's impactful to industry and to government in terms of their day-to-day -day work. So for example, taxis. You want to track where are all the taxis, you know, what's their motion, where, you know, uh, where are the people, where are the taxis, what's happening. Airplanes, we want to track the movement of airplanes. Shoppers in a mall, so we actually have users that, um, that manage airports. And airports, you can think of it in addition to dealing with airplanes. You know, when they told, told me that they're an airport and they're using geospatial analytics, I assumed they were tracking the planes. But it turns out they're actually tracking the shoppers because the airport makes a lot of money on the renting the space and on getting people to buy things. And so what they do is they have little sensors inside the airport to track people's movement in order to optimize their paths through the airport and to create the right shopping experience and to maximize their, their income there. Um, cell phones, so cell phones are, you know, you know cell phones are sending out signals and that it's producing geolocation data. And that data can be used for good or for bad purposes, but you know, at a very basic level, that a cell phone provider wants to optimize the coverage they're giving. And they're, they're investing in towers. How do they know where to put the towers? What other better source of data is there than where people are going with their phones? Looking at that long history of data, we can see that the path of people around the planet where, and where the cell phone coverage is most needed. Um, customers versus retail outlet location. So if you're a bank and you're managing a, 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 a portfolio of thousands of branches, you could be, look, this is not a real fast moving data, but you've got population data, customer data with their addresses. You want to match that up with the branches and try and do some analytics to figure out where you should be placing these branches in order to maximize the, the customers you have being able to easily get to the branch. In military logistics, with, you know, use your imagination, the, there's clearly a use case where you want to track people and things. Um, parcel delivery, so if you're a, you know, a uh, in the United States, we've got UPS, FedEx, et cetera, in every country. Lots of countries have different parcel delivery companies. And these parcel delivery companies really want to, are an optimization game of logistics. And so tracking where the drivers are, where the packages are, this is key to their success. Oil and gas discovery and logistics, again, you've got physical assets out there, you've got heavy equipment, you've got um, actual oil underneath the earth. And when we say geospatial, geospatial, these, these modules like PostGIS can support three-dimensional. It's, um, it's not just east and west, it's also up and down. Insurance claims, tracking where claims are happening, agricultural assets. And so these are all industrial and government use cases that impact people, everybody. And so being able to enable your database with these geospatial capabilities allows you to take advantage of it. Now, when does it really become big data? In a lot of big data use cases we have, if you look at the biggest tables, the biggest tables are history tables, right? So if you just want to know the, the data set now, sure, there's the data. But what if you want to know that data, the data set of where everything was, let's say here we've got an example 
a ride-sharing application. I won't use any names in particular, but let's say you have a ride-sharing application. You've got 500,000 cars, and you've got millions of people who, are, who have your app. And you want to be maximizing these logistics, right? You want to be tracking the locations and maximizing logistics, analyzing this data. Now, you can track where is everybody now, and if you did that, every car, you'd have 500,000 cars and there's a location, so that's 500,000 rows in the database. But what if you want to know where every car was every hour for the last year? Now your 500,000 row database became 4 billion rows. And 4 billion rows, that's where you really need an MPP system to scale out and store this data and start to analyze it. So it's really the history data, and when you're doing historical time slices, you know, what was it then in these intervals, that's when it really becomes huge and you want to create a geospatial warehouse. Now, the other key point is with Greenplum, we really talk about combining data into multiple types and formats of data to create a consolidated data warehouse view of the data. We're, we're really talk, hearing from users the idea of getting a new data platform for each type of data is, is aggravating. It's because you need another vendor, you need another set of experts in-house who know this particular technology. So let's say, for example, you want to start using Graph. And so in order to start using Graph, you need to get a new database technology, which is a GraphDB. You want to do text. You've got to get a new database. You've got to learn how to back it up, how to restore it, how to replicate it how to monitor it, all the things you do with any database. So one of the main value props here in Greenplum is to mix geospatial data with other data too and other algorithms, right? So that you can create a combined robust data, data warehouse, right? So we can take geospatial data, we can take text data, we can take graph data, we can do classifications, clustering, and do normal SQL and really combine and join that data and explore it interactively. And by doing that, you've got not just geospatial, but the, the full data set. So for example, back to our ride sharing application. In this case, we're gonna store the history of the driver's location. We're gonna store the history of the app user's location. Meaning every hour, let's say, maybe it's interesting to know every hour, where was the location of this person or this car? Right? So that, and then over a stretch of time, let's say a year, in order to do a good analysis. You want to also store the history of their payments. Now this has nothing to do with geospatial data, but it's another data set, the payments data, maybe in another table, and you want to be able to join that and, and do queries that combine geospatial with other things. Right? So you might also have user preferences. You could have, sometimes if you, if you didn't like your ride, you put in a comment. Now, how do you process that comment and figure out what was the natural language meaning of that comment? So we want to get a text column and do text analytics combined with the geoanalytics. And then with the, the ratings for the ride. So it's really creating this holistic picture. And when you create this holistic picture with a long history of data, you get a large data set and you need a database that can scale and handle all, of this, all this type of data and all these type of queries. So that's kind of the, that's the business context and the user context. Now we're going to go into PostGIS itself, because PostGIS is the delivery vehicle whereby we enable geospatial analytics in Greenplum. So within PostGIS, there's four major categories I want to call out of functionality. Number one is vector data. And vector data is going to be the, the primary data we talk about today. This is the, the basic geospatial elements of storing points and lines and coordinates, and, and it's, it's a vector in a sense that you don't store every point, you just store the beginning and the end or the key points in order to create that um, geography type. Now point two is raster data. Raster data, think of it like a bitmap. It's a grid of cells with, with different values in it. Um, these could be real world raster data like a PNG file, a JPEG file, a bitmap file, they can also be complex types of data, like a satellite image. Right? You can take all these different things, you can chop them and slice them up, and you can store this kind of data in, in a database. And this data can start growing large. Um, geocoding. So geocoding is the process whereby you take a description of a place, 
and you map it to a location. So for example, you've got all of these addresses and you want to reverse that back into longitude and latitude. So that, you need a geocoder for that. So that's another core capability of a geospatial database. Um, I think I'll also mention indexes. Indexes are not listed on this slide and you'll see it a little bit later, but index, geospatial indexes are another key enabler and I'll wait till we get to there. Um, and lastly, topology and PG routing, which enables uh, graphs and graph-like processing in the database. And I wanted to also mention that we have another way to go about a similar thing in Green, Plum, and in Postgres, which is Apache Madlib, which now also has um, geo uh, graph processing in it. So let's, for the rest of this session, we're gonna actually drill into the vector data, which is the basic geospatial operations and really to do a teaching and tutorial of how it works. So within the vector data space, we've got, here's a sampling of some of the features and functions or data types and functions that are provided. So the data types in vector processing include points, lines, um, polygons, which are shapes, and then as well collections of these things. So you could have a, a multi-polygon, for example, some, some country might consist of a multi-polygon. It's not a just one area. It could be the United States, for example, right? You've got Hawaii is out there, Alaska is out there. So it's not a strict polygon, it's a multi-polygon. Within, those are data types. Now within the functions, we've got things such as um, getting the length, finding the perimeter, finding the area, finding the distance between two points or two, two objects. And then we've also got native operators, which are used um, to, these are shortcut hand for other functions, for example, bounding box intersections, which we'll talk about. So this is just a quick sampling of the types of things you can expect to see in PostGIS vector data. Here's some very simple syntax for you. So you can see here we're going to create a table called geometries. The way it looks like is you say you can create any columns you want, and then you can create a geometry column. So a geometry column can store any of these data types, points, lines, polygons, multi-polygons, et cetera. So within there, it's a little bit of an overloaded data type. So within there, we're going to, in this example, just go ahead and create some, some rows. So we're gonna create a sample point, a sample line, a sample polygon, and this will, you can then query it out, and you can use functions. Most of the functions start with st underscore, and you can say, ST as text, and then passed in the geometry object, and it will give you a textual representation of what it, what it is. If you don't do ST as text, and you just select out the geometry, it'll just be a bunch of numbers which look like random numbers to you. You won't know what it means, but it has some internal representation. So using the as text, you can see what does it really mean. Now, these are all simple data types. They're, they're geometrical data types, points, lines, polygons. But now let's start talking about the Earth. So for the audience here, what is the closest description of the shape of the Earth? And it's not worth getting the mic, just yell it out. Ellipsoid. Ellipsoid? Anyone else? Well, it turns out that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. So an oblate spheroid is the actual shape of the Earth. And so if you want to calculate the distance from New York to Tokyo, you can't just do it by a line. You need to find out the path over an oblate spheroid from here to there, right? So there is some complex math to calculate a distance from New York to Tokyo. Um, and in order to support these types of operations, PostGIS has two core differentiated data types. And the first one that came out was geometry. But after that, I think geography was the second type that came out to provide a more of a wrapper to make it easier for you to work with this type of data. So within the geometry data types, these are what we were showing before. These are not necessarily connected to any place on Earth. They're just geometry, right? Points and lines and, and polygons. And so in order to use these, you need to map it to a coordinate system so that real world um, metrics can be applied to it. So PostGIS comes with a, a coordinate mapping system. And I'm not going to actually go into that today because I find that it's, it's something better to learn when you need to later than up front. 
Um, but it's a key point to all this is that there, when you have any data point in a geometry, it's tied to a coordinate system. If you don't know the coordinate system, the data won't make any sense. Now these geometry data types are the, the highest performance. They're good compared to geography. Geography is slower, but the good thing about geography is you don't have to figure out the coordinate system. Once you get a successful geography object created, it knows internally where it lives on the Earth. And you can, you can do operations across the whole globe without any inaccuracies, because they're the most sophisticated calculations in that code. When you try to use geometry, and you want to, for example, get the distance from New York to Tokyo, it won't actually work. It won't actually work accurately, because there is no good coordinate system that can use geometry across that big of a spheroid to get an accurate number. So for, you have to do things like do different types of projections and or use the geography data types. So the bottom line is, is that these are the fat, geometry are the, the, the simpler base types, which are the lower level access. Think of it like assembly code to C code or something like that. And, and you use these for performance and to get the most features. And geography are the, the kind of more wrapper functions that are easier to use and not make mistakes with the, with, with the geography calculations. Now, another key concept here in geospatial databases is joins, relationships and joins. So in a normal database query, if you have two tables and you want to join them, you're looking for some matching key of equality, right? So you're saying, I've got a table of customers and I've got a table of orders. Let's join them so that I can get all the rows in the orders table that match each customer, right? Based on, let's say, customer ID. And that's an equality join. But in geospatial, we're doing other types of joins. For example, here, we can do intersect joins or overlaps joins or containment joins. So we're looking for topology, not topologies, but geographies and shapes that have these relationships. For example, shapes that overlap, intersect, or, um, or, or touch each other. So in this example, what we have is we have a data set here of New York City subway stations, New York City neighborhoods, and we're doing a containment join on contains and looking for do these points exist inside that polygon, right? So that's a, contain, that's a spatial join, and that's one of the really powerful features of a geospatial database. Another key item of geospatial database is spatial indexes. So indexes in general in the database make your queries go faster, but they're not quite traditional indexes in a spatial database in the sense that it's telling you exactly where to go to find an item. In, in geospatial indexes, they're bounding boxes. So when you create a geospatial index, each object, whether here you've got a line or a star, we're creating a box around that object which bounds it. And by bounding it, we're creating it something that's easier to calculate, quicker. So we can more easily do relationships like containment and overlapping because you can, it can be done quicker. And so by creating these geospatial bounding box indexes, what happens is that the engine itself, when you do these, these relationships, will will first eliminate all the rows that are clearly not related because their bounding boxes don't touch. Then it will do the more expensive calculation to confirm whether the actual objects are related in the requested way. And you'll be able to see it when you do an explain query. You can see, oh, it's using an index. Okay, so let's actually get our hands a little dirty and show, show some data and some queries and, and, and walk through some examples. So in order to get some good examples, thankfully, our, one of our partner companies, Boundless, who's an open source geospatial company, dedicated really on, I would say, well, the whole stack of, of geospatial, um, but I would say closer to the user, closer to the middle tier and to the front end and to working with the users, as opposed to you know, Greenplum, which is the back end database that enables this. So we work together on a lot of projects. And they've created a great tutorial. You can check it out, workshops, boundlessgeo.com, post this intro. And we're going to use the data set that they created there for, this, for these examples. And in this example, they have five tables, New York City streets, 
New York City subway stations, neighborhoods, homicide records, and census data. So this gives us some data set we can work with to see how to use a system. And this is where I'm going to really rely on the audience crowd to help me, because what I'm going to attempt to do is a live demo, live generation of SQLs. So I'm going to be testing myself and the audience here to help me write SQL code for geospatial on the fly, live streaming, super high pressure. OK. So exercise number one is find the three largest, and I'm going to transfer to sitting. Find the three largest New York City neighborhoods by area and the three smallest neighborhoods by area. So what I'm going to do is open up my, my system here. OK, that's interesting. I can type there and see here. <laughs> so in this database, we've, oh, let me connect to the, to the system. So we've got a increase the font. OK. All right, can you guys see this? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into the GeoDB, and we are going to look at the tables that we have. So we've got our census blocks, our homicides, our neighborhoods, our streets, subway stations, and also this special <laughs> spatial reference system, which you would use once you get a little more advanced. So first, we're going to start with subway stations. So let me do a quick description of the subway, street, subway station table. So if you see here in the subway station table, we've got the key item is here. We have a geometry type. This geometry type with the column name geom, that's storing the location of the subway station. This is all extra information about the subway station, which is metadata around it. And so what was the problem we were trying to solve here? We were trying to find the three largest um, New York City neighborhoods by area. All right. So in order to do that, let's take a look at the, how about we do a function called area, right? So we're going to go to the, actually, we need to not go to the subway stations. We need to go to the neighborhood table, right? So let's go to New York City uh, neighborhoods, right? And here we've got the borough name, the, the, um, the, so the borough name, if you're not familiar with New York, is there's five boroughs, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Within there, we've got neighborhoods, right? And so let's try select ST area, and then we're going to pass in the geometry from New York City neighborhoods. And we said, um, where the borough name, right? Uh, let's just do this limit one. OK, limit one. And, but we're going to need a little more information to know what we're talking about here. So we want to get the borough name and the name, right? So we've got Manhattan, East Village. Here's the area. And we're looking for the three biggest ones. And I think, was it in Manhattan? We were looking for total, total New York. Okay, the three biggest ones in New York. So how are we going to do that? Um, was it the three biggest boroughs or the three biggest neighborhoods? Three biggest, three biggest neighborhoods. Okay. So then what we should do is, um, and help me out here with the SQL. But what we should do is order by, um, order by three, descending. Right. So the three biggest. Um, neighborhoods we can see here. They're in Queens and Brooklyn. Canarsie, I've certainly heard of that one. Sheepshead Bay, these are the big ones. And if we want the three smallest ones, right? Um, did I get it right? The three smallest ones. This is uh, Rosedale, Coney Island, et cetera. If you see in Manhattan, Little Italy is the smallest neighborhood in Manhattan. OK, so now I think the second question to this was, Find the three smallest neighborhoods in Manhattan. OK, fine. So let's, let's just do a quick filter right, on the metadata and say where borough name equals Manhattan. Right? Single quotes. Single quotes? It's OK. No, single quotes? All right. I guess I need single quotes. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so Little Italy, North Sutton area, and Chinatown, those are our three smallest 
The biggest are Washington Heights, Upper West Side, and Harlem. Okay, great. Now, let's go exercise two. Exercise two, find the largest and smallest borough by area. So what we gotta do now is we've got to add up the area from all of these neighborhoods to get a sum total for each borough, right? So let's see. What we need is, we're gonna need the borough name, right? Otherwise we're lost. But then we're gonna want the sum of the area, right? And then we have to do a group by um, the first column. Right? And then one more trick I would do is I'm going to cast this to an integer to make it easier to see, and then maybe order it. Right? So we can see this is the ranking of the size of the boroughs. So Manhattan's the smallest, Queens is the biggest. Right? All right, great. Now, next what we want is we want to locate the latitude and the longitude coordinates of the Wall Street station on the red line in Manhattan. Okay, so now we're gonna really test ourselves here. Now hint, this is actually a little bit hard um, to, at first, but once you get it, it's not actually that hard. But the hint is, what we've done is we've created, we've got this geospatial set of subway stations, but what is the, the object is not a geography. We have objects are geometries, and geometries don't internally know they don't internally represent it. You can modify the coordinate system. So the trick is, in order to pull this out, there's a little hint here which says 4326. So 4326 is one of the coordinate systems. It's a coordinate system that represents latitude and longitude. And so what we're gonna want... What's that? Yeah, it's the... Um, it's the EPSG. So EPSG stands for what? something. Right, so, so there's a set of coordinate systems and you can search it and, and whatnot, but I just wanted to yep. save time here. Yep. 4326, now, um, how are we gonna find out, and this is a little bit of a, of a hacking exercise here, so what I wanted to do is say, yeah, you can go to the documentation, but let's have some fun, right? You know, we've got a table here in the catalog called, um, called the PG proc, right? So let's select um, star from PG proc limit one, right? And, and you can see here that the pro name, the pro name is the name of the function, okay? And so instead of limiting one, let's say where pro name is like st blah, right? Um, oops, I think they're lowercase in this thing, okay. So st blah, these functions are, um, a lot of these are the geospatial functions, st blah. We can also go to the documentation, but you know, what fun is reading documentation? Um, so what we wanna do is, we're gonna want latitude and longitude, so let's, let's try and find something that is related to that. So here's some functions, st something, and in fact, I'm gonna, uh, Try it this way, and anything here look interesting? I think st lat long text is interesting. Like I'd like to call that function. So if I have a geometry type and I want to find out its its um, position, right? I'm going to use this one. So let's. We're, I'm just taking you through this here all the way from from scratch. So let's backtrack. We've got first it said the Wall Street station on the red line. So let's find that that person or that thing. So the subway stations, right? New York City subway. Okay, so we wanna get select long name from New York City subway stations where name is like wall, maybe. So, and there's the two, three line and the four, five, right? Two, three is the red, four, five is the green line, if you've ever been there. Um, so what we want is the, the other one, right? So let's, let's throw in here the color, the color, right? So let's make it easier for ourselves. And color equals the red line. Okay. Now, let's get out the geometry. 
So there's our geometry. Now what we want is the latitude and longitude. And we had this, this function, right? Um, the function was st as text, right? So let's, instead of getting the geometry, let's call it st Latin Lodge as text. And it says it's 2567. So let's go to the source of that information, right? Which is Google Maps, and find the Wall Street New York City subway. Okay, there we go. Here's the 2 3 line. And if we look here, what's here? It's 40 and negative 74. 40 and negative 74. Okay, that doesn't match this at all, right? That's because it's nonsensical. We haven't picked the right coordinate system to make any sense of this data. So what we need to do is we need to take our hint and convert this to coordinate system 4326 before we call this thing, this thing. Now to convert to another coordinate system, a geometry, we have to call st transform, I think, 4326. And now it's 4074, right? Which, um, if you see here, it matches the 4074. I'm going to assume we got it right with the positives and negatives and the norths and the wests. It'll take you a while to figure out which ways those go. But it's the same numbers, 40 and 74, right? So we're on the right track. Um, the other thing we could try is to, instead of this one, let's try, let's get back this query. And just for laughs, let's create a geography out of the geometry. And it says, only lat long coordinate systems are supported in geography. So it's not even allowing us to create this because it knows it'll mess it all up and be nonsensical. So, but what if we went back here and did the transform first and then try to create a geography, all right? So now we were able to successfully create a geography and now we could try doing st as text to print it out, just doing a text print. Let's see. And that gives us 40 and negative 74, which was the same as our, as our numbers here, right? In fact, it's actually the pluses and minuses match 40 and negative 74 matches the Google Maps, right? So you can successfully turn this into a, into a geography object from a geometry and then print it out. So, so we did it, we win. Let's go to the next one, exercise four. Exercise four is calculate the number of miles from Wall Street to Times Square using the two, three red line. Okay, now I'm gonna actually modify that a little. Let's just calculate the distance between the two places. We're gonna do a distance calculation. So in order to do that, we, let's, we gotta find two places, two geometries and call it distance, right? Now, one of the really neat things about doing exploratory analytics, right? Imagine you've got this huge data set. You don't want to go and necessarily have to write a Java program every time you want to change your query, right? We can just interactively browse here and mess about through SQL, right? So what I want to do is actually find these two things of interest and store them in some temporary tables. That way we get them out, put them somewhere we can use it, and then call the distance function. So help me out here to find the... Wall Street Station, which I think we found already. Okay, so let's, let's get this one out here, but instead of getting all these things, let's only take out the geometry, and we'll create a table called Wall Street. Okay, now let's find the, what was the other one, Times Square? Yeah. Times Square, right? W there, okay. So there's the Times Square one, two, three red line. So let's get that one out and do create table as select times. Create table, wait, what did I do wrong? Create table times as select, right? And then just remove these extra attributes. OK, 
Okay, so now you can see we've got the times table and the Wall Street table. Select count star from times, select count star from wall, right? Street, so we've got our two, two points. So let's try select DT, ST distance, and then select geom from times and select geom from Wall Street. What did I get wrong? Okay. And it says 5,833. What is 5,833? No, hint is, I think it's meters. All right, so let's take a look. So we want to go from Wall Street to Times Square. Roughly. Okay. So and let's walk it. It's 3.8 miles, give or take. So how far is 3.8 miles? Again, Google is it's too good. 3.8 miles in meters. So 3.8 miles in meters is 6,100. So that's the walking distance. Our data was, um, was, I think, just over the air, right? We just said the distance between these two points. So, okay, we're in the right ballpark. We got the right calculation here. Um, so that's how you do it. So we, we stored out this geometry, we stored out that geometry, we did the distances, right? Okay, there's only six or seven of these things, so bear with me here. Uh, we did number four, number five. Okay, here we go. Let's do some mass operations. And you, you got to assume that this, this is running right now on a VM on the MacBook, right? MacBook Air. If we had a real data set, it would be running on a cluster of 100 servers with petabytes of data and doing massively parallel processing. But for the example, it's on my MacBook. Create a new table with the number of miles between all subway stations and the Wall Street station. So we want to take that same station but then recalculate every other station and how far it is in miles from there. So we're gonna get this new data set of how far are you from here? And you think about the, the bank branch locations where the, the bank wants to think, okay, how far is all these other rows from this row and let's optimize and maximize, right? So, so let's try and create this new table. So we've got the, the Wall Street station, right? And I think this is gonna be a fancy thing called is this a correlated query? Anybody? So we want to get, so let's see, we're going to say, let's describe the subway stations again. The subway stations have these attributes. So let's get the long name, the color, and the borough of every station. Okay. And now all we want to do is get the distance from this station to the Wall Street station, right? So how are we going to do that? We're going to have to call ST distance, right? So ST distance, and we want to get it. I'm going to create an alias to make this easier. This is going to be as NSS, OK? So this is the New York subway station table alias. I'm just aliasing the table name so I can make a quick reference to it. So we want to go from NSS geometry to select geometry from, time, from Wall Street, right? Does that look like it's going to do it? Boom. Now we said miles too, right? How many meters in a mile? Let's see. How many meters in a mile? Meters in a mile, 1609.34. So let's divide our distance by 1609.34. And yeah, let's do that. OK. And let's give that one an alias as well. Whoops. Space. Space. So we got the distance from Wall Street. And let's order it. Um, order by distance from wall. 
ascending. Okay, so the Wall Street Station itself is zero miles. The Broad Street Station is 0.07 miles. The other Wall Street Station, the 4.5, that's a little bit over to the west. That's on Broadway, I think, so that's 0.14. And then you've got all these Manhattan stations all downtown, right? Now if we keep going out, here's 34th Street, it's three miles, 45th Street, 49th Street, uh, 57th Street, 72nd Street, 86th Street, right? So still in Manhattan, we're up to 137, 161st, Yankee Stadium, JFK Terminal. Don't ever take the train to JFK, take a cab. It's, it's all hype. Okay, so there you go. And Staten Island is the furthest place if you want to. Don't, don't live in Staten Island if you want to work on Wall Street. You end up taking a ferry. Okay, so we did, uh, we create, oh, but we didn't create a new table. So, you know, this is the magic of interactive exploration. We're just going to do create table as create table distance from Wall Street as, and then we get our new table. Right, so we can say select star from distance from Wall Street, and boom, there's our data, right? Cool. Okay, let's do exercise number, actually last exercise, number six. So bear with me through the last one. Find the Manhattan neighborhood with the most and the least people. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do some joins, spatial joins, right? We've got the neighborhood table, and we've got a census table. How are we going to mosh that together to get the people in the neighborhoods, right? Hint, don't cheat. Okay, there's actually, I noticed there's actually a neighborhood field in the population table, so you can do this with one table. But we're going to join. So what have we got? Let's, we've, we've seen the neighborhood table a little bit, but what's the population table? So if you see here the census table, we've got Let's see, a block ID. This is a census block. We've got the population total. We've got population by, by race. We've got the borough name. And then we've got the geometry. So the geometry, what is this geometry? We said it's overloaded, right? It could be a line. It could be a string, right? So if we say select ST as text geom from New York City census blocks limit one, it's a multi-polygon, right? So it's a census block, multi-polygon area. So how are we going to find out which census blocks are in which neighborhoods, right? Let's use, there's a number of functions, but as a hint here, let's go with intersect. We could also go with contains. Actually, let's try intersect and contains and see what's the difference. I have no idea. I've never done it before. Again, it's on the fly. So we got to do a join. Spatial join. So let's say the other table was the New York City neighborhoods. So we want to do select borough, borough name. Actually, I'm going to have an alias here again. New York City neighborhood dot borough name. New York City neighborhood dot name from New York City neighborhoods um, as an N. OK, great. Now, we want to join this with census block, right? So what is in the census block? Again, I already forgot. Census block, we want the block. We want the geometry, right? We want to find out when that geometry, let's get the top population total, census block population total, and from New York City neighborhoods, join on ST intersects. Um, oh, OK. Join on join table. Yeah, good. Join table name. So join the New York City census blocks alias census blocks on, right, st intersects. And now we want the geom and the geom. Does that look right? Right, it's the three columns from two of the tables joining on 
the intersection between the geometry in both columns? Maybe. OK. So this is the, for example, I don't know. Let me get Manhattan so it'll be easier since I'm familiar with Manhattan, where borough name equals Manhattan. What did we do wrong here? Borough name is that right? Oh, OK. Where NN. Well, wait, borough name should come from the neighborhood, right? OK, so it's telling me this, these different census, let's order it by two, by the second column. So within Battery Park, there's these different census blocks that have the different number of people, right? Within Carnegie Hill, et cetera. So these are, we're going to test this out. So it looks like this added it up. Now let's do a group by. We want to get the sum. What am I trying to do here again? Total population per neighborhood, right? Okay. So we need to sum up the population setting, right? Sum of the population and group by these two. Does that look right? Yes? OK, and then let's do order by number three, descending. OK, so there's a lot of big boroughs in Brooklyn. Let's do ascending, more interesting. Um, so some small, interesting here, Coney Island. Um, you know what? I'm going to again filter it to only Manhattan so that so that we can get a subset of the data, where nn dot borough name equals Manhattan. Okay, so here's our boroughs and our populations. So let's go to our. Now remember, we did intersect, right? Now I'm not 100% sure that intersect is the right way to check this because there could be things that overlap, right? And intersects, then the census block might intersect more than one place. So I'm thinking, for example, that our figure here, let's say Tribeca, shows 20,000 people. So if I go to Google and say population of Tribeca in New York City, it says there's 10,000 people Right? It's this little section here. And we got 20,000. I wonder what would happen if we did contains. What do we get? 13,000. So I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit fishy data, or I'm not exact, or it's out of date with the times of when Google counted their population, when this counted this population. But 10,000, 13,000, we got the right figures here. Chelsea, 48,000. Upper West Side, 191,000. So I think, in general, this is how we do it. We're doing joins on contains, joins on intersects, right? You can do all these different types of joins. So going back to the, to the PowerPoint, OK, so let's get back to Greenplum. So with Greenplum, Greenplum 4.3 supports all these vector types. We've supported this for a while. You can do this store or create a huge data warehouse of coordinates, geographies, geometries, to contains, to intersects, to um, spatial joins, indexes, create and, and really analyze ge geospatial data. For the roadmap, Greenplum 5, which is just a nearing, it's already in alpha and is getting nearing to beta and GA, we're going to support in the roadmap raster data support. So raster, again, you can store image files. You can store, and Im a lot of image files are, are not that big, right? They could be couple megs, but you can also store huge satellite images. In that case, you need to slice them up into to sections, and then there's ways to, to piece it together. Um, but you can, as well, one of the key th cool things about PostGIS is you can query between, the same way we're doing relationships here, you could query between pictures and geometries, and you can start to find 
G uh, spa coordinates and spaces and map them to photos and satellite images and stuff like that. Future updates is to continue to upgrade PostGIS. We want to do geohashing. We want to do geocoders. Remember, geocoders is the way to look up locations based on text. Um, and then for people out there who want to really get deep into geospatial, one thing I would highly recommend is to check out the Phosphor-G. So Phosphor-G is an annual, it's an it's a, it's a organization that has an annual conference. And you can see 2015 was Seoul, Bonn in 2016, Boston this year coming up. And this is a geospatial dedicated open source conference. And because it's open source, PostGIS is really at the heart and soul of it. And so it's a great source of meeting people and, and hearing talks. I wanted to share with you just some of the names of the talks from the last um, Phosphor-G, just to get you thinking about what's possible. Um, open Sky Network, Crowdsourced and Open Air Traffic Surveillance Network. Renewable Energy Mapping and Assessment in the Arabian Peninsula. An overview of Docker images for geospatial applications. Flood Watch, Combining Wearable Tech and Disaster Alerts. Challenges of Indoor Mapping Formats. 500 plus billion points, organizing point clouds as infrastructure. GDAL 2.1, what's new? GDAL is at the heart. It, GDAL is a C library that does all the math. So PostGIS itself even inherits from GDAL to do the calculations. Mapping Wi-Fi measurements on OpenStreetMap data for wireless street coverage analysis. OpenStreetMap, I gotta give a shout out to OpenStreetMap. It's, it's, it's a set, a data set that's publicly available similar to Google Maps, but all the raw data is available and people contribute to it from all over the world. And you can download this and actually store these data sets in PostGIS or GreenPlum and do analytics on it. Um, other resources to look for to learn more about this, this topic, postgis.net, that's the homepage for PostGIS. Planet PostGIS, this is blog articles. Every time there's new blog articles, they're coming up on Planet. Greenplum.org documentation. Greenplum.org mailing lists, the workshop that I showed you, you can do the full tutorial and workshop from the Boundless website. This meetup, meetup.com, learn, learn about Greenplum, San Francisco. There's a nice book called PostGIS in Action by Regina Obey. She's one of the people on the steering committee for PostGIS, and she wrote a good book there called PostGIS in Action. And then as well, the Phosphor G conference recorded videos. The Phosphor G conference, especially some of them recorded videos. There's about 100 videos of talks given there of these different interesting topics. So if you go to YouTube and search Phosphor G, you'll find interesting stuff. So I encourage everybody to, to really get involved with geospatial and liven up your database. Any questions? Three D geometries? Yeah. It does. Three. You can do altitude. Okay. It supports altitude, and uh, I think they're doing. You can see when you, there are hills and mountains. They're having different geographies. They can create maps in the geo server that show up and down. Yep. Point clouds. So point cloud. Um, do you want to talk about point cloud a little bit, Tushar? What is point cloud? Yeah, so I've been like exploring a bit on point clouds, and it's currently supported only on Postgres nine. Like, there are some tweaks that could be done, but I haven't like. But what is point cloud? Oh, so point cloud essentially is like it's a sort of a three D data, which and and similar to GDAL, there is something called PDAL on the point cloud in the point cloud ecosystem, which allows you to do transformations and. So you have these sensors, right? The yeah. sensors are out there collecting real-time um, feedback as to where things are, right? And then yep. creating a point cloud, and it could be used for autonomous driving, right? Yep. You could be having it check where is the car, and you create these point clouds, and there's a... Uh, it's also used in satellites, I think we yep. found, right? There are a lot of aerial, like there are some vendors who also do like aerial imagery. So for mm -hmm. defense applications, they have like very powerful like LIDARs, which basically f are like, you have helicopters flying over areas and they, basically you can get a lot of detailed information about the terrain. And right, and, and, and actually I got a tip from somebody who works with LIDAR data who said, LIDAR data is huge, 
right? LiDAR data is a new source of data, relatively. It's huge data, it's collecting sensors all the time, so it's, it blows up. That would be a great use case and application for a, a version of Postgres that can scale out to huge data sets, right? So we really would look forward to supporting that in the future, or having, having people use that in the future. Okay, so thanks everybody.